Hi everyone, um, thank you for coming, well, attending and watching this training today. Um, this training is called um, Practical Strategies to Support Handwriting. And I'm Ellie Lawley, I'm one of the SEN Occupational Therapists. And my colleague, Shauna Hunt, will also be delivering this training with me. Um, so we'll take it in turn to deliver the slides. I'm gonna turn my camera off now, just so you're not distracted by my video. Um, and you can focus more on the content. So the aims of this presentation is to help you understand handwriting development, to identify common handwriting difficulties, to help you learn strategies that can support with handwriting difficulties, um, and then to develop an understanding of when to start typing as well. Okay, so why is handwriting important? Um, so it's not just about being able to record your ideas and your thoughts, but that's the, the key. That's the most important reason why we need to handwrite. But it's not just academic, academically that we need to handwrite, but practically too. For example, making shopping lists or lists of things that you need to remember. If you haven't got a phone or a kind of a laptop to hand quickly. If you want to make notes when you're listening to a teacher or a lecturer or you're doing a training in your job and you just want to make some quick notes. Um, if you're writing letters um, or you're filling out an application form, a lot of application forms still need handwriting to be clearly and legible. So, um, so it's important to think about why handwriting is important. And what we often see um, is kind of a side effect of handwriting difficulties is you might see students who have difficulties with their behaviour in the classroom and a lot of the time if they're having handwriting difficulties this might be because they're using techniques to kind of avoid written work um, or distractions or um, which is also linked to their self-esteem because if you're very self-aware and you're noticing that you can't write as well as your peers and you're feeling left behind then this can obviously affect your confidence and your motivation to handwrite and then you might see students who have amazing ideas about handwriting and sorry about um, their written work and ideas of things that they want to put down on paper but their written work doesn't reflect this so then you get frustrations as well because they have um, fantastic ideas and they understand what they need to do they just can't write it down easily um, so this is some of the common problems that we see when we have difficulties with handwriting so before we start thinking about strategies to help with handwriting, it's really, really important to look at the typical development of handwriting. So as occupational therapists, we will always look um, at the student in three different ways. So we look at the person. Um, so this could be looking at their posture. So can they actually sit in a helpful way at the at the table um, to start even working on any kind of uh, mark making or handwriting activities. Can they pay attention in a task? You need to be able to pay attention to kind of begin learning about um, mark making or handwriting. Um, do they have the, the overall gross motor coordination and fine motor coordination to, um, to cross their midline, um, which we'll talk about a bit later, um, to to kind of hold a tool and, and use it and move it across the page. And, and are they motivated as well? Is that person actually wanting to handwrite? Are they ready? Um, so that's the PEO model, we call it, and that's the P of the PEO model. Then we might look at the environment. So we look at the tools that the student is gonna use. Um, are they ready to start using a pencil yet? Or are they still at the kind of scribbling stages? Uh, what's the best way that they can access learning how to handwrite? Can we make it more motivating and more fun or break it down into smaller chunks if they're having difficulties? Um, we need to look at the desk size. Is it appropriate? Is the environment set up for them to have the right posture to, kind of, to sit and learn to handwrite? So that's the environment that we're looking at. And then we'll also look at the occupations. That's the O. It links to kind of smaller activities that the students need to do. Um, so developmentally, we'll look at where they're at 
and then how we can support them to do short small activities to develop their handwriting so that could be anything from drawing um, scribbling to then starting letter practice and letter formation to anything up to writing an essay whether that's um handwriting it in cursive um joined up writing or whether that's writing an essay on a computer or both so this is how we would look at skills development in kind of the PEO model. And the developmental stages of handwriting are really, really important to consider when you're looking at what the child is actually doing right now and how you might support them to improve their handwriting. So these are kind of the typical stages of handwriting, which I'll go into more detail as we go along. Um, but you can notice uh, the difference between the two-year-old and the five-year-old. Look at how different their posture is. Uh, look at them using their helping hand as they progress to hold the paper. But a two-year-old isn't ready to do that yet. Look at the different grips that they're adapting as they grow um, and mature and get the hand strength that they need to then write more sophisticated kind of shapes and letters. Um, so it just kind of just shows that you know, developmentally, a two-year-old won't be ready to sit and handwrite yet. <laughs> and I'll talk about this now as we look at the different stages. So these are the typical development developmental stages of handwriting um, that as OTs we will look at. So we always start with scribbling and then moving on to pre-writing shapes, uh, we call them. And we'll show you those later. Uh, then we would say start with capital letters because they're easier to write and um, there's some other reasons why we should start using capital letters and you'll find that students tend to start with capital letters anyway, um, especially those with SEM because they're easier. Then we move on to lowercase letters, then we look at letter sizing because that isn't a huge priority when we're just getting them to practice writing letters and you know forming those letters or shapes, but then we can focus more on sizing once they've got more of the um, control to draw their letters. Then we look, can look at orientation and that's, we mean um, how they write their letters in relation to the line. So can they put their letters on the line? Do they know that they're meant to be writing on the line? And then we'll go up to joined up writing. But as you can see, that's kind of the last of our priorities, um, especially with students with SEN, uh, we want them to develop you know, the formation of letters initially, and then we can work on sizing, orientation, and joined up if we feel that they, they're ready for this, or it will be helpful. So the developmental stages of writing. So the first stage, as you mentioned, was scribbling. Um, this is a really, really important stage. It basically shows that the child is motivated to pick up a tool like a crayon or a piece of chalk or anything really, makeup, like, <laughs> like lipstick, and they want to use that to mark make, which is amazing. We want that motivation to hold the tool to mark make. So scribbling is a really, really important um, stage of handwriting development that we really want students to, to have fun with and really enjoy. Um, as you can see, the picture on the left of this slide is my niece who drew all over the <laughs> wall that my brother-in-law had just painted. Um, so he obviously was quite frustrated <laughs> that she'd done that. But I, on the other hand, was like, wow, look at those scribbles. They're like starting over free writing shapes. That's amazing. But he ended up having to buy her an easel to um, <laughs> that she could scribble on, which I understand it. he just painted the wall. Um, but it just shows you that she was ready to then um, you know, start looking at using a tool to mark make. Um, so we'd start with scribbling and then we'd kind of work towards aiming that scribble. So it's kind of directed into a certain area. So as you can see on the right hand side of the slide, there's what we call aim and scribble pages where students can actually start focusing on where they're going to scribble. And that's when you kind of start getting more control over the crayon and holding it you know, with more purpose. Um, so that's why scribbling is so important. And then we can look at pre-writing shapes. Um, these are, are, again, a really, really important for students to practice um, in loads of different fun ways. But you really, really need to be able to 
to master these pre-writing shapes before you should really begin to start writing any letters. And we find that some, some students might rush, um, they might try and start handwriting because they're motivated to, or perhaps there's different priorities in the schools that get them to start writing when they're not ready and they can't write their pre-writing shapes yet. And then you might see difficulties with um, behaviour or avoidance because they're not their hand strength isn't there yet or their posture's not there yet and their upper body strength for them to be able to draw these pre-writing shapes and then later on in down the line you might get some you know difficulties with handwriting so um and fluency so this is why focusing on pre-writing shapes is really really important and you can see the different ages where students are expected to be able to draw these shapes and even five years uh you know they've they've probably developed their triangle. So, um, and as it says, children who can adequately draw the oblique cross can copy a significantly higher number of letters than little ones who cannot. So they're very, very important for the foundations of letter writing. So pre-writing, um, this is where you can make it really, really good fun. And there's lots of lots of different ideas that where you can practice pre-writing shapes. Um, it doesn't have to be sat at a table because the students might not be ready yet to sit and pay attention for a long period of time. So make it really fun. Use lots of multi-sensory strategies. Um, use different tools like paintbrushes, chalk, short crayons. Um, see if they can, you know, uh, name the shapes. Can they check their work? Can they tell you what shape they've drawn? And always use vis visual and physical cues to show children where to start writing their pre-writing pattern. So, for example, um, always starting the line, the vertical line from the top to the bottom or from left to right. Um, just because you're introducing these concepts of shapes and direction, which you're going to need to reinforce when you start introducing letters. So pre-writing shapes are really important to use. And then this is just some some fun ideas of um, how you can use or learn pre-writing shapes in different ways. So you can use Play-Doh or putty. Um, writing shapes in sand is really good fun as well. Um, or on shaving foam, that could be in the classroom, in a tray. It could be outside in the playground. It could be in the bath at home or on the on the wall of the tiles. You know, if they're having a bath and you want to just reinforce those pre-writing shapes that can be really fun um, or painting it looks like this one's on a window um, painting on a, a wall um, in chalk is really good fun um, and trying to do it while the students standing up is really important because if they're doing it on a vertical surface that can really help that develop their upper body strength which is vital to then have more control you know, and have a better pencil grip in the future. But Shauna will talk more about this as well later on. So, as I mentioned previously, we we would suggest teaching capitals first, especially for those that are struggling, um, because they're easier than the lowercase letters to write. And they're all made with the nine pre-writing shapes. So if your students been practicing the pre-writing shapes, capitals will come easily. Um, they're all the same size and they all start at the top of the, um, the line, which is really, really important for students to remember where to start their letters. Um, so we'd start with capitals and we'd teach them in order um, as they're grouped according to the moting demands that they require. So they, it kind of gets harder to draw the capitals as you develop through the alphabet. And, and this kind of approach is taken from the learning without tears. Um, it used to be called handwriting without tears, but and you can Google this too, and there's a little link at the bottom that you can have a look at too, if you want to. But that's the approach we would suggest. And then you might be teaching certain numbers at the same time as well. But again, as you can see from this visual, there's a little arrow at the top. So having a, a visual prompt, it could be an arrow to show them where to start. It could be a green dot to show them where to start to draw a number or draw a, a letter. Or it could be a smiley face. That's one that we find really popular and kids love smiley faces. So if they know there's a smiley face there, they know that's where they're meant to start their letter or their number. 
but always having a visual prompt to remind them where to start will help you in the longer term so that you don't have um, problems with reversals and letter fluency. So, so then you would teach numbers and then lowercase letters as well. Um, and this is linked, this is kind of grouped in different um, groups <laughs> of how you would teach it. So um, the same as the capitals. Um, and then you go to magic C letters, go to transition groups, diver letters and the final groups, which is the more tricky letters. Um, but we recommend teaching it in that order as well, because it kind of goes from easier to harder which you want as the student develops their hand strength and their motivation to handwrite and their, um, yeah, their letter formation. Then once we've started, you know, really, really reinforcing how to write letters, um, we might then go on to looking at the size of the letters. Can we help the student to make them smaller? Um, and one way is obviously to help develop their hand strength and there's some more ideas uh, that you're going to talk about later to develop hand strength because they need strong hand strength to control the pencil and obviously pencil grip is really important um, depending on their age but also um, you, you can use visual prompts as well so we often recommend a strategy called sky grass ground paper which we'll talk about and show you later but this can also help with the sizing of letters and then also we need to make sure the letters are orientated to the line. So do the students know uh, where the line is? Do they know where to start and end their letters in relation to the line? Which is why showing them when they're first starting to form letters to start at the top and go down is really, really important because then once you introduce the line, they'll know where to start better. And then if we get to this stage with some of our students with SEN, uh, we might feel that their print handwriting is enough, um, but some students are really motivated and they might see their friends writing in cursive, so they might want to learn that too. But we'd always say um, there's no better way of learning cursive than other ways. Um, some might need more practice as they're more complex, so perhaps finding the most simple cursive is the best way um, to introduce this. And we teach the process about how to form the letter and not only the the outcome with a, you know, if they're copying from a worksheet. It's all about reinforcing how the letter is formed and repetition with an adult to learn kind of that formation of a letter. Because if you're just doing it rote, copying from a book, you might not be thinking through how you're forming that letter. So it's always good to have that kind of direct instruction. And these are kind of the typical developmental grasps that we'll see and the age ranges. Um, so we start with kind of the, the pincer grasp, which they'll develop when they're about 10 months. Um, they're all quite long names. So at 12 to 15 months, they might develop the palmer supinate grasp, where they're kind of a whole hand grasp around a, a tool. Um, two to three years, they might then, you know, rotate their wrist and be able to do the digital pronate grasp. Uh, where they're starting to kind of um, have more control over their wrist and their hand. And then three to four years, they start then developing more of a static grasp. And then between four to six years, they would develop, meant, develop the more mature dynamic tripod grasp. Um, and, you know, this is, I have to re remind everyone that this is typical development as well. And even some adults, if you think about your own pencil grasp, it's not, it might not look like any of these, or you might not have developed the perfect grasp, um, but you can still handwrite. So we would only really start looking at pencil grasp if it's um, the student's hands are tiring, if it's really, really affecting their formation and their, you know, the formation of their letters and their motivation. Um, but if they're older and, you know, beyond the ages of kind of seven, eight, nine, and they've still not developed a functional grasp, then we might just look at either pencil grips or we might just kind of focus on helping them in other ways to kind of handwrite or type better. So it's kind of picking your battles with pencil grasps. And Shauna will talk a bit more about these later. Um, but before you're even going to introduce letters, 
it's really important to think at where the student is at in terms of are they ready to start writing so and drawing letters so most importantly do they actually recognize letters um, because if you're getting them to copy letters or to start writing letters that they don't even know what they are it, they're just shapes you know that won't help them with their motor memory for writing letters um can they copy vertical horizontal circle and oblique lines the pre-writing shapes because that's really key to kind of helping with their letter formations do they have the right posture on the fine motor control um to be able to sit and attend the activity and control the pencil like fluently uh, what's their eye hand coordination like um perhaps we can work on more of the gross motor skills that really really help with that is handwriting foundational skills and do they understand that writing goes from left to right you know visually um can they follow that um do they do they know their left and right as well that would help too so i'm going to pass you on to sean and now who's going to talk a bit more about identifying handwriting difficulties and the strategies that we suggest thanks Shauna. thanks ellie um, OK, so, yeah, now we're just going to talk a little bit about yeah handwriting difficulties and kind of get you thinking about any, you know, possible contributing factors um, which might be inhibiting your child from progressing with their handwriting. OK, so um, when you are observing a child's handwriting, these are kind of some of the common problems um, that you might notice or that you should be looking out for. So think about the child's body posture. Um, you know, are they slouching? So the impact of good sitting posture and core strength um, is often quite overlooked. Um, you know, poor posture can cause increased strain on your body, which then leads to fatigue. Um, so it's really, really important that we are kind of mindful um, of the child's posture when they're writing. Um, thinking about the positioning of the child's forearms and their wrists. So you know, you might assume that neat handwriting is all down to the way in which your child holds their pencil. Um, but the position of their wrist plays a really important part too. Um, so the wrist should be below the writing line. So kind of not really like hooked or or in the air um, above it. Um, and this enables your child to see the tip of their pencil as they write. So we don't want to be blocking that. Thinking about the child's pencil grip um, and the tension of the grip. So the best pencil grip is a comfortable grip, which allows the hands and fingers to move freely um, when the child's writing and drawing. So, so uh, some children do, however, hold their pencil very tightly and they often press very, very hard on the page. Um, and as a result, this can kind of result in quite, you know, slow and effortful handwriting. And then their hands, you know, easily become quite tired and sore and things like that. Thinking about um, the pressure, so, you know, is the child writing too light or are they pressing too hard, like we've just mentioned? Um, and could that be the reason why, you know, they're fatiguing? Thinking about, um, you know, is the child actually able to stabilise the page um, using their non-dominant hand, so the one that they're not holding their pencil in? Because um, that obviously reduces the page from moving and, and then that ultimately supports you know, neat um, and legible handwriting. Um, and then, you know, thinking about their letter formation. So, you know, watch the child, observe their formations. Um, you know, are they starting their letters from the wrong position and um, like from the bottom to the top? Um, or circling clockwise rather than anti-clockwise? So we do see that quite a lot. Thinking about the organisation of the letters and the words on the page. So try to observe, you know, how the letters are spaced. Um, you know, are they aligned on the page or are they on the line? Um, is there too much space in between the words or the letters or are, you know, are they too, too cramped together? And then, as Ellie mentioned before, thinking about the interest of the child, you know, in writing. So obviously, if the child is reluctant to write, um, you know, or they give up too easily, they're going to, you know, quite easily become really, really frustrated and they're going to lose their motivation. So trying to keep, you know, handwriting practice 
quite short for these children, but obviously, you know, frequent. Um, and, you know, if it's appropriate, maybe even talk to the child about how they feel about handwriting. So, you know, does it worry them? You know, do they find this difficult? Um, do they care about it? You know, what particularly do they dislike about it or do they find challenging? OK, so as I've mentioned, you know, sitting posture is you know, it's really, really important for children and it is often quite overlooked. So thinking about the correct or the ideal posture for handwriting and what that looks like. So if you look at the picture here, um, we always recommend that the child's feet are flat on the floor. So, yeah, we don't want them kind of dangling um, up in the air. So you might want to consider something like maybe a footstool if their feet aren't um, touching the floor making sure that their hips, knees and ankles are at a 90 degree angle. Um, make sure that their back is up straight um, and inclined towards the desk. You often see children kind of sitting quite far out from the desk, but um, yeah, it tends to work a lot better if their tummy is quite quite close to, to the table. Um, and yeah, that their back is up straight, touching, touching the chair. Making sure that their forearms are resting on the desk and um, with elbows with elbow level with the desktop at 90 degrees. And obviously, you know, try to encourage them to relax their shoulders and their necks and things like that. So how do you kind of identify if a child's having poor posture or poor co per core strength, which is then, um, you know, causing um, this, this, this poor posture? So you might notice that the child is, you know, slouching back in the chair and they might be leaning forward. So quite, quite close to the paper um, almost yeah, placing their head on the table. Basically, they might be even resting their their hand on their head as well because they're feeling quite fatigued um, or they're they're moving quite a lot and they're changing up their positions um, because they're finding it hard sitting in, in the one position. Um, they might also have poor balance in the chair um, or you notice that they're complaining or feeling tired and things like that. I'm going to want to discuss some things that you can do to help the children develop their core strength um, so that they can achieve that kind of that upright posture for longer in the next few slides. Um, here's just a quick checklist as well, just to remind you and the child about you know, um, the posture and the setup at the desk and what that should look like. So just some things to be mindful of, like you said before, so things, you know, feet on the floor, pull your chair into the desk, using your good grip, um, stabilizing your paper with your helper hand and things like that. So yeah, this is this is quite visual and it could be just a good, a good reminder for, for yourself and the child. So if the child is having difficulties sitting upright, what can we do to support them? So we can use things like a sloped surface. Um, so this kind of um, slope board here, the, the clear one here um, on the right hand side, this is um, kind of encourages the child to sit up straighter um, and to keep their head at a good distance from the paper. So this can help with their posture. Um, you can also try to ensure that the chair, the desk is at the appropriate height. So like I mentioned before, you know, a footstool can be good to, to help their feet rest. Um, and obviously you can get some height adjustable tables as well, if that's something um, that's required. And, um, you know, just giving the child verbal reminders to sit up, um, especially when they're copying from the, the board and things like that. Um, sit them towards the front of the classroom so, you know, their field of vision is, is quite clear. Um, giving them movement breaks. So if they're feeling, you notice they're quite fatigued and they're finding it hard to sit in that one position. Yeah, giving them a quick movement break, even if it's just for, you know, 30 seconds to two, three minutes, this can really help, um, you know, reduce the fatigue and the stress on their bodies. And um, so things like, you know, jumping jacks, running in the spot, going up and down the corridor, jumping on a bouncing ball and things like that. Um, yeah, those kind of um, quick breaks can be really great. You can also give them um, a move and sit cushion, which is the green cushion here. You can see the child is sitting on um, and that's particularly helpful for children who, you know, move around quite a lot on, the, or on their chair or who, ha who sit with quite a poor posture. It's like inflated with air. Um, so the child has to work a little bit harder just to keep their 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 body upright. Um, and it also kind of gives that sensory feedback. 
um, for children who, who move quite a lot. So yeah, it does help them to, to sit for longer. OK, so thinking about some, um, you know, alternative kind of sitting positions and things like that. So if the child is learning to write or you're doing any kind of pre-writing shapes and things like that, you know, if the child is having difficulty sitting, you know, due to their posture or due to the fact that they just feel like they need to move, you know, you don't always have to have the child sat down, you know, on a standard class chair um, to write with a marker or a paper. So like like I said, specific specifically for our sensory seekers, um, they might actually be a lot more likely to engage if they're not sat down. So you can, you know, try a variety of positions. So things like, you know, standing at the table um, you can use a vertical easel, which Ellie talked about previously. You can use things like large sheets of paper stuck to a wall. Um, if you don't have um, large sheets of paper, if you've got any like spare paper bags, um, you could make that a little, cut it and make it a little bit bigger and then you could stick that to the table or wall as well. Um, you can also maybe um, ask the child to kneel as well um, or they could work on all fours. So like propped on their their elbows and, and their legs and put the, the, the paper flat on the floor. Um, actually having the child in this position, which kind of, you know, puts weight through their arms can actually help to really strengthen and stabilize them. Um, so, yeah, that can be really good to develop um, their fine motor and um, control and things like that and the foundational skills um, for writing. So those larger um, muscle groups. OK, so as I said before, you know, it's really kind of important that we develop the strength um, and the stability of our larger muscle groups. So, so, you know, our muscles like in the neck, the shoulder and the core, you know, because if we don't have them, the child's really going to find it difficult um, to use their hands and their fingers and, and to really control these. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, these, these kind of building skills are like the foundation skills that we need um, before we kind of work on the, on the fingers and things like that. So what kind of activities can we do um, to help them to develop, you know, their core and their shoulder strength? So we can do things like animal walks. Um, they're particularly good for, you know, younger children. So things like crab walks, frog jumps, um, commando crawling, gorilla walks. Um, bunny hops and things like that. You can get lots of different visuals online um, and you can show the child these visuals or you can model them yourself and you can have a little bit of a competition. These are quite fun. Um, you know, maybe in PE or even as like a movement break, you can do things like, you know, press ups, push ups, planks, um, any of these kind of like challenging positions um, any kind of like weight bearing activities. So things like climbing, anything which is going to give kind of, you know, force or pressure or input into our muscles or, and joints are quite good as well. So any kind of like playground equipment. Um, and as I said, you know, lots of movement breaks. So you can actually go on um, noodle.com, go noodle.com, sorry. Um, and you can find lots of different, you know, really quick movement breaks on there as well. There's lots of different things on YouTube to too, um, some really quick videos that you can find. Um, OK, so thinking about, you know, um, children who are really struggling with with the grasp. So what could we kind of do for them? So try to consider, you know, is the pencil they're using? Is, is this the right right? Is this the correct writing tool for them? Um, so it might be worth trying a different pencil um, or even a different grip. Which we'll go on to talk about in the next in the next slide. Like I said, focus on developing those larger body movements to help develop their strength and their bilateral coordination. Um, and work on large surfaces using whole arm, arm movements as well. Um, so, you know, things like the wall, the easel and things like that, they're, they're really, really great. Um, and work on fun activities to encourage their tripod grasp as well. So we really want to build up those fine, small muscles in the fingers. So activities that you can do to support this or help develop this are using things like, you know, tweezers. So using tweezers to pick up pom poms or little small little beads, marbles and things like that. You can ask the child to maybe pinch some clothes pegs um, and you can also try some games if you have any of these at home or in school. So things like operation, 
Battleship um, and Kerplunk as well. Those ones are, are really, really good. OK, thinking about, you know, if you need to adapt the pencil. So if the pencil's not working for them, they're really not getting that grasp. Um, you might want to consider maybe a pencil grip. Um, we do generally say that pencil grip should only really be considered for children maybe who are over the age of five um, and who have received some support to develop their pencil grasp already. So we don't really want to just jump into this. We really want to try and encourage the children to, to adopt that grasp you know, themselves and to really learn how to hold the pencil, like I said, by doing so many of these different activities. So lots of these pincer grip activities. Um, so yeah, it's not really like the first strategy that's tried for the child who's having difficulty um, holding their pencil. So obviously, if that child cannot achieve that, you know, that tripod grasp and you feel like, you know, the grasp that they're using is, you know, negatively impacting on the quality of their handwriting or it's causing them discomfort or fatigue or pain, then obviously it, it probably is beneficial to maybe try a pencil grip. Um, and, you know, that's really going to help them with the positioning um, and the movement of their fingers um, while they write. So here's just some of the pencil grips that we sometimes recommend. So we've got things like the um, the foam grip. Um, we actually don't have a, pen, uh, a picture of that here, but that can be mainly good for children who are you're just having a little bit of discomfort and maybe they're getting some sore and some sores on their finger or they're using too much pressure so it's a little bit more comfortable for them and um, you can use the crossover grip which is the little green one here at the bottom of the screen so that's quite chunky it's very very soft to hold and um, we've also got a foam grip here which is the red one and um, so yeah that can be quite good too for children who again are having a little bit of discomfort it's quite large so it's very comfortable um, Probably one of the most popular ones that we use are the um, ultra, um, the crossover pencil grip, sorry, which is the red one here in the corner. So this one we tend to recommend quite a lot. It helps the thumb and the index fingers um, slot in quite nicely. Um, you can also try um, a weighted pencil grip, which is here in the left hand corner. So this can be beneficial for students who do not really press hard enough when they're writing. Um, you know, or for students who have kind of poor body awareness and they need that additional um, proprioceptive input or, inc or you know, that, that, that more kind of um, awareness um, of, their, of their pressure into their hand, that, that can be quite useful. So you can just pop that at the top of the pencil um, and secure it with maybe a foam grip um, below it or something like that. Um, OK, and thinking about some um, handwriting aids, so other kind of alternatives that you can use. Um, so you can use maybe a slant board. Um, so I think I've mentioned that. So that can obviously help, you know, with children who slump over their work as obviously encourage them to sit up straighter and keeps their head at a bit of a bit of a distance from the paper. Um, and it's actually also good for children who use too much pressure when they're writing um, as the board supports the weight um, of the writing arm. The Dysem anti-slip mat here, which you can see on the right hand side, um, is good for children who, you know, they they maybe they're not using their non-dominant hand and the paper is slipping quite a lot um, or they're just not able to support the paper quite well. Um, so, yeah, that kind of ensures that the paper doesn't move around a lot um, while, while the child is, is writing. Um, OK, and just thinking about, you know, how we can actually improve the child's um, the child's fine motor strength, you know, the small fine muscles in their hands and the dexterity and things like that. So we could do lots of, you know, everyday activities, you know, so things like, you know, climbing, um, you know, any kind of crawling or any kind of weight bearing activities They're, you know, they're naturally going to help their their, their hands grow stronger. Um, but obviously, you know, some children may need additional help in the day. So you might want to schedule some fine motor, um, you know, time, some fine motor intervention with the child. Um, and some of the ideas that you could try, you could do things like tennis ball man. So you can see that here in the right hand corner. So you get the child to squeeze the ball with their non-dominant hand and maybe pick up some marbles or some coins and you can pop that into the, the slot in the in the ball. You can do lots of different things with Play-Doh, clay, therapeutic, get them to push, press, roll, pull this. 
Um, like I said, you can use tweezers, you can crumble paper, tear them apart, you can get them to pull rubber bands, maybe get them to place that over like a toilet roll or a, a plastic bottle, um, squeeze clothes pegs and hole punching. Um, that's really good for like developing hand strength. So, you know, the pressure and things like that and the force that they have to use is, is quite good. But yeah, just try and keep them fun. You don't want the child to obviously get bored um, and use lots of kind of sensory based activities, you know, especially for our sensory seekers. And um, so the Play-Doh and things like that are quite good for those children. Um, OK, so I'm just going to pass you on to Ellie um, for the next few slides. Thank you, Shauna. OK, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the classroom strategies that we'd recommend. Um, I think, as we say, uh, being able to focus and attend in the classroom to be able to then learn and to sit and handwrite is really important. So if the student struggles with paying attention, um, sitting them at the very front of the classroom, so they're very close to the, um, the whiteboard and the teacher, um, so they're not distracted by their peers or kind of um, doors that <laughs> people might be walking past, you know, just reducing the distractions can be really helpful by sitting them at the front of the class. Um, if they're having trouble with the sizing of their letters, as I mentioned previously, or they find it really hard to kind of keep their letters on the line, um, they might have visual perceptual difficulties or just difficulties with um, knowing where the line is and maintaining letters or just they're struggling to kind of make their letters smaller. Having a visual prompt is really helpful. So we always recommend using something like the sky grass ground paper, um, which you can see the example of here. Uh, we'd always recommend starting with bigger lines first and you can get different sized ones. You can find these on Twinkle or you can actually print them on Google Images or we have copies as well that we're able to share with you. So um, they're quite easy to get hold of. And you would gradually, you'd use larger lines first for the student to get used to it. And then you would gradually reduce the size of the lines um, so that the student has to kind of have more fine ridge control to reduce the size of their writing. Um, and you'd always kind of show them again where to start the letters in relation to which line they're going to draw on. So do they start in the grass? Do they start in the sky? Uh, does the... Does the letter like a G, does it bump the line and then it goes underneath the line? So these kind of visual supports can really, really help the students to know where to place their letters correctly in relation to the line. And you can get different ones as well. It's not just sky grass ground. You can highlight above the line um, and it's a similar way of just showing them visually um, where the line is and where to form their letters in relation to the line. And you can get lots of different types of coloured paper to kind of explore and I would try suggesting different ones with different students um, and see which ones they prefer and which ones they find the most helpful because um, involving the student is really powerful as well for them to kind of invest in these strategies. Uh, if they struggle to know where to start with, from left to right you know on the page um, put a prompt there to, to show them, you know, maybe smaller students you might put the smiley face again or for older students Highlight the margin, make it really, really clear that you want them to start next to the margin um, because some students just really find this hard to, um, you know, to initiate and to start. Some students, um, they could practice letters if they're copying them, but then if you take away that visual reminder of where to place the letters, they might not be able to remember where to place the real letters in relation to the line. Um, especially if the student has difficulties with their working memory. So um, what we would suggest is it could be um, an alphabet prompt, just like the one that's already on the page here with the sky grass ground. You could laminate a small version of that and put it that the student has next to them constantly, just to remind them where the letters are placed in relation to the line. Um, or you could just have a, a typical kind of line with the alphabet written on. But it's just to visually prompt them to help their working memory um, because it's difficult to expect our students with SEN to kind of remember uh, the whole alphabet when they're also trying to remember 
their ideas and to record their ideas and all the other kind of rules to do with handwriting. Um, so the visual prompts are really, really powerful. Um, reducing the demands as well is helpful. So if they're struggling to kind of look at the information on the whiteboard, if it's very, very visually busy and there's a lot of information, can you print out shorter, smaller handouts with less information um, or that they can copy from, you know, with next to them rather than having to look at the whiteboard? Because sometimes once students shift their gaze from their piece of paper to then look up to their white, the big whiteboard, the interactive whiteboard, they might lose focus or something might distract them and then they'll forget what they're doing or they'll, um, you know, they'll struggle to go back to their writing task and then they might get in trouble or <laughs> they might avoid it. So um, just making it a bit easier for the students, so having handouts or using a small whiteboard to kind of help them copy from if you're copying work from the board anyway. And this will just help those students that struggle with attention as well. And tips for left handed students. So um, try not to sit a left hander on the right of a right hander, if that makes sense, during writing activities. It might seem really simple, but as their arms, they'll keep bumping into each other and it will restrict their movement. Um, and it's really important that they're able to handwrite freely. Um, and it might re reduce kind of um, instances of um, frustration. Uh, so consider that with our left handed students and write the model on both the left and the right hand, right hand, sorry, right side of your handwriting practice sheet. Um, if you are using any writing aid like pencil grips, um, even scissors, you know, anything that you're supporting the students um, with adaptations, just check that it's uh, tailored to left handed students um, because they'll be holding it in a different way to the right handed kind of grips and adaptations. And then always slant the paper slightly to the left um, so it's diagonal because this can really help the left handed student to to better see what they're writing. And it also puts the wrist in a, a more helpful position so they won't tire as easily um, without slanting the paper. If you keep it straight, what can happen is the student, as Shauna mentioned, they might start hooking their wrist so that they can see what they're writing more easily. But then this is obviously will lead to kind of uh, shoulder pain, um, difficulties with moving, like isolating the movements of their hands. So, um, yeah, always try and slant the paper for a left handed student. Um, there are lots of different um, handwriting programs as well, and you might have ones that your school uses, um, which are different to these ones. Um, these are just some that we've used as an OT team in the past. Um, the one that I mentioned previously that we we really, really like and it kind of fits really well with SEN students and that kind of multi-sensory approach is handwriting without tears. And it's now called um, learning without tears if you want to Google it. Um, but it's a really lovely um, approach and it has four different levels from pre-writing skills to using cursive, but it has really fun ways of teaching those skills. Um, the early programme focuses a lot on helping students develop that body awareness and their position of their own body in space, um, which is really important for them to then learn how to move their body and kind of um, manoeuvre their body parts as you kind of need with handwriting. And it also works on kinesthesia. So knowing the awareness of the position of your limbs and joints without needing to use your eyes. <laughs> so this is really helpful with handwriting so that you can kind of, as your handwriting develops, you're less focused on the visual aspects of handwriting and you kind of, it becomes more part of your motor memory to write letters. Um, and it has different ways of teaching kind of kinesthetic, fun, multi-sensory ways to teach writing and letter formation. And um, We would definitely support the um, learning or handwriting without tears um, strategies and we can model some of these as well to you um, and your students too. Um, it also enhances body awareness so uh, it helps with proprioception, um, it helps with pressure through the limbs uh, when they're writing and help like Shauna mentioned with those gross motor movements it helps teach patterns of movements which can then support with coordination for handwriting as well. 
uh, right from the start. That's another kind of two volume um, book with a teacher guide as well, and it has sheets to photocopy. Um, there's eight sections over the two books which address uh, perceptual motor skills um, and kind of spatial relations. So those are for kids that are really struggling with them. Um, you know, spacing their letters and ad adhering to the line. Um, loops and groups program. This uses movement patterns again to teach cursive writing. So it's probably for the more advanced students who are ready to kind of progress their letter formation from print to cursive. The speed up program. This is one I've used in a secondary special school. Um, for kids with dyspraxia and um, or DCD and kind of ADHD and it has some really lovely um, fine motor strengthening ideas that can also help with dexterity. Um, it's designed for children aged 8 to 13 years but I've used it with older students who whose handwriting is quite delayed or they're having issues with handwriting um, and it can help improve, improve sorry, their fluency and their speed of writing uh, which can be helpful at this age. It also um, suggests kind of movement and music activities, which can be more motivating as well. A uh, right dance. Uh, this is for the more kind of children between five to eight year olds. And they it's a progressive music and movement program. So it's all about developing those gross motor skills to then help with them um, developing pre-writing and writing skills. Uh, so that's quite a fun one to try. And then printing like a pro is another one which has just some really fun worksheets to work through. Um, you can use different aspects of all the different programs if you want to. Um, you know, it's up to you how you use your programs. They're interesting to look look at, you know, to find new ideas from if you're struggling. Um, but the one we definitely really enjoy working with is the Handwriting Without Tears program, or Learning Without Tears is now called. Um, so obviously we've already talked about the different paper that you can get and using an alphabet strip, which can help with the placement and sizing of um, letters in relation to the line. Reminding students that they need to bump the line sometimes when they're doing letters. So making sure they go from the top, knowing where to start and then go all the way down to the line when writing. Um, supporting students to help develop their own awareness of their own handwriting, so kind of self-checking it um, and reinforcing that it's okay if they've made mistakes. This is why we self-check and we can um, edit our own work. And this is important to do as we get older. Um, so that's really helpful to help develop their self-awareness. Uh, spacing words can be quite tricky for a lot of students. Um, so different ways of teaching finger spacing. Uh, I know I've seen uh, TAs and teachers kind of just yeah like use a little fingerprint between words to help the student be more aware of what space to leave um you can also really show them that if it doesn't read very well a sentence if it doesn't have any space in it so you can ask them to read a sentence that you've written where there's no spaces um to help show why it's so important um you can get them to do again to self-check their own work because um self-checking it again is developing their own awareness but then their independence as well is because as they're going to go especially from year six into year seven in secondary school they'll be more responsible for checking their own work so um teaching this skill from an early stage is really really helpful um if you're getting them to copy um your writing just make really big spaces <laughs> so that it exaggerates it so that they can remember to leave a big space If the student is um, struggling kind of with pressure, so if they're putting too little pressure on the pencil and their writing's quite hard to to read because it's so light, there's lots of different things you could could do to help them understand how hard to press on the paper. Um, if they press too lightly during these activities, they'll have a negative result and they'll have immediate feedback of how to hard to press on the paper. So it will help with their body awareness again. Um, knowing how much force to use when they're handwriting. So things like crayon rubbings are really helpful. If there's too little pressure, uh, the image doesn't come through clearly onto the paper. Um, and then once they've achieved the perfect pressure, you can then see if they can 
um, try that again with their eyes closed because this will help with their um, awareness of how much pressure to use and reinforce that kind of understanding. Uh, and then you can get them to write a sentence and see if they can do it with the same amount of pressure. Using wax rubbings can really help as well so the student has to press down hard to be able to see the drawing underneath. Using tracing or carbon paper is helpful too. If the child doesn't press hard enough, the image won't show. Um, sometimes just using a softer pencil can also help. Um, but it, it's really good to try and teach them that body awareness, to their understanding of how much pressure to place on the pencil. Um, so that would kind of be the last thing we would try is a softer pencil. Uh, like Shauna mentioned previously, if the student is putting excess pressure, um, this can be really tiring for them and it means that they'll write more slowly and it's more effortful. Um, so things like the slant board that Shauna mentioned earlier can be really helpful. And we want them to know that, to understand that, again, that they're putting too much pressure on the, on the paper, so on the pencil. So things like putting carbon paper under the student's page can help and then encouraging them to try to write um, so that it doesn't actually transfer through the paper. Um, so they have to write softly as it's kind of the opposite of the strategies when you're pressing um, too lightly. Using a ghostwriter can be helpful. So um, that's when the student writes a word and then rubs it out and the other student or a friend can see if they can guess what the word is. If they've written too hard, the other student will be able to see that they've left an imprint. So it's quite a fun little game, but it kind of helps develop that awareness. Um, if you put a soft mat or a piece of cardboard under the page as well, if the student presses too hard, it will go through the paper. So um, that can help also kind of help them grade that force. Um, a pencil grip might be really helpful if they're really holding onto the um, pencil really hard. It might will just take the pressure off a little bit and stop them squeezing the pencil so they won't tire as easily. And mechanical pencils, I've used these quite a lot before. They're the ones with the really thin leads that um, will break if you press too hard. So this can help them modulate, learn to modulate the pressure that they're putting on the, the pencil. Also, if this is really tricky for them, putting a weight on the end of the pencil, you can get different ones, say from Amazon, if you just Google pencil weights um, or using a weighted pencil, what that will do is it will force the the top of the pencil back into the web space and take the pressure off the student um, so the handwriting will be easier for them and they'll be exerting less force so they won't tire as much um, and then practicing handwriting by putting a sheet of paper over a piece of sandpaper and then um, it gives lots and lots of sensory feedback um, and can be really heavy muscle work for the hand but it also shows how much pressure the student is using so that's another strategy as well. It can be helpful. And then the last slide is around reversals. So that I'm going to deliver. Sorry, I'm going to hand you over to Shauna after this. Um, so reversals is a common problem. And, and usually this originates from if the student has learned to, to form letters too early on when they're not quite ready or they don't understand where to start and end letters, or it can be linked to other conditions such as dyslexia and um, you know struggles with visual perception. Um, but there are lots of different ways that we can um, teach you know reversals in the right way. Uh, again, having that kinesthetic memory of where to start and end letters and repetition of how to write letters is really important. But not just handwriting on a piece of paper or a workbook that can be not very motivating for students, they might give up quite easily. So using chalkboards, um, using interactive whiteboards to show where to start and end, uh, rainbow writing where you kind of write the same letter but you keep going over it in different colours. Um, some students love that. Um, making letters out of Play-Doh, writing kind of with a wand in the air, so you're kind of air writing. Um, doing this with your eyes closed as well, so you're doing it without using your vision. So you're kind of getting that body awareness of how the letter is formed in your brain. Um, there's fun songs as well for reversals on um, YouTube. If you want to have a look for, there's a bed song. <laughs> I've used that before and as well as a prompt card to remind students, you know, where to start the B and the D and um, 
which way round it should be. Because again, visually, students can't always remember how letters are formed. So if they have a visual prompt, this will really help them. Um, again, getting them to self-correct their work. Um, they might not even realise they've done a reversal. So uh, recognising it themselves can be quite powerful. And teaching left to right as well. Sometimes students might not have learnt laterality. Uh, so what's the left and right side of their body? So teaching that might be able to then help with their letter reversals because you can reinforce go from left to right. Um, so that can support that too. You can do that through gross motor skills as well. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Shauna now. Thanks, Shauna. She'll deliver the last section. Thank you, Ellie. Um, okay, so now we're going to move on to, um, you know, keyboard skills, thinking about when you might introduce this um, and using alternative assistive, assistive technology um, if the child, you know, continues to struggle with handwriting and things like that. Okay, so when to introduce typing? So typing can be done alongside handwriting. So, you know, some people might think, oh, if the child is learning to touch type, will that mean that, you know, we're neglecting their handwriting? But, you know, that that's not the case. So rather than thinking about one method or the other, we need to think about the two skills um, developing together. Um, so, you know, if a child learns to ride a scooter, then they could still learn to ride a bike. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and it's actually really, really good for children to develop their hand, right, their touch typing skills because, you know, they're increasing their muscle tone and their dexterity, um, which comes from typing. And obviously that's going to, you know, positively impact their handwriting and um, as a side effect as well. So it does have its benefits. Thinking about when we would introduce typing. So, um, you know, if the child is, you know, struggling on, you know, the content of what they're writing, you know, because they're using too much mental energy, trying to produce legible print writing um yeah it could be a good a really good idea to introduce this then um you can start as early as year three um if you estimate that it would be nor a normal way of, of writing by the end of key stage two um so and you know touch typing actually is really really beneficial as well for children who you know, have dyslexia um, as the tactile element of pressing the keyboard um, can really help in managing those difficult words as well. Um, so, yeah, possibly about maybe year 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 two or year three um, is a good time to, to think about this. And as I said before, typing can be done um, alongside handwriting as well. It doesn't have to be um, a substitute. OK. So thinking about the child's readiness for using the keyboard. So obviously, like learning a second language, um, there can be real benefits to introducing children to touch typing um, at a young age. Now, obviously, for children, you know, below year two or so, you know, they probably haven't fully developed their motor skills. So they, they so their hands are probably going to be a little bit too small. Um, you know, to rest their hands, you know, on the keyboard and, and things like that. So we'd normally recommend maybe starting between maybe seven um, and 11 years because their hands are obviously the right size and they'll be more likely, you know, have the motivation and the concentration span um, to learn this skill. Um, thinking about how often um, you would um, try to practice touch typing. So little and often is generally more effective than doing like a longer session. Um, so we'd normally say probably about you know, 15 to 20 minute sessions, um, maybe scheduling this three times a week, four times a week if you can, rather than doing, you know, one hour lengthy um, long session a week. Um, and obviously, you know, as the child becomes a lot more familiar with the keyboard, um, then you'll eventually begin to work on their speed and their accuracy and things like that. But yeah, at the beginning, you literally just want them to be becoming familiar with the keyboard and trying to identify where the keys are and things like that. So yeah, don't be worrying about speed or anything like that at the, at the very beginning. Um, and some of the typing programs actually have really great kinds of um, built in reward programs. So, you know, it helps really helps to motivate the child and keep them on track and things like that. And um, so, yes, yeah, some of them are, are, are really great for that. I'll go on to talk about some typing programs that you can you can try as well. OK, so 
Obviously, for some children as well, they might have difficulties using um, standard keyboard and mouse. Um, so here's some kind of alternative adaptations that you can try. Um, you've got the ball mouse here, which is the, the, the silver one here on the left hand corner. Um, that can be good for people who don't have full wrist and arm mobility as it only requires slight movement of the fingertips. So obviously that makes it more accessible than the standard mouse. So that's probably going to be good for children who have a little bit of a, a maybe physical impairment. Um, so yeah, you might want to consider something like that. You've also got the one click mouse, which is the, the black mouse on the right hand side. Um, so this is quite a small mouse. So if the standard mouse, if, if the child, you know, can hold on to or can secure their hand onto the, the standard mouse because the buttons are too far apart and things like that. Like this can actually be a good option. Um, and children can sometimes be confused about whether to use the right or the left button on the standard mouse as well. And um, because this this mouse here actually has one single um, tiny button for them to control. So it's going to be a lot easier for them. Um, You've also got a the lowercase keyboard here um, and this is sectioned into different colours and that obviously helps children to quickly narrow their focus down to the correct part of the keyboard, you know, whether that's symbols or numbers or letters. Um, the divided keyboard, so obviously some children, we, we notice that they tend to use one hand or the one hand over the other, you know, they might just end up using their, their right hand, so we always encourage them to use two hands. But to help the child kind of, you know, section the keyboard into its, its right and left side, um, you can actually split the keyboard between the TGB and the YHN um, letters. Um, so you can use something maybe like a piece of wool um, or a sticker or something like that just to kind of go in, in between. Um, yeah, that can just make it a bit more visual um, for our children. OK, so other um, strategies and resources that you can um, access as well. So talked a little bit about the, the typing programs that you can access. So these are just some, some of them here that you can access. Some of them are free, some of them are paid. Um, the one that I usually go to quite a lot is Typing Club. I find that one really, really great. It also has like a, a, a tracker kind of progress. So it's got so many different levels. You can you can go back to the set the, the set where you left off as well. Um, BBC Dance Mat, um, that's quite a popular one as well in, in a lot of our schools. Um, keyboarding Without Tears, I haven't actually used that one, um, but I've heard some good things about it. And um, you've also got some typing games for children who need a little bit more motivation, maybe. So that's the Big Brown Bear, Nitro Typing and Popcorn Typer as well. Um, and on this link here, I'm um, setting up a typing club that just gives you a little bit of advice into yeah how you might run a group and some things to consider and things like that. OK, so if you were not going to develop, you know, if you, your child's not really fond of typing, these are just some kind of alternative um, kind of apps or technology and things like that that you might want to consider. So the speech to text software um, or the app. So this software basically, um, you know, takes what the child is saying and types it down for the student. So it can actually be very empowering for children who have dysgraphia or dyslexia or just who have a very hard time um, writing simple sentences. Um, word prediction. So this is a software um, which obviously, you know, helps the child helps the child to who has you know literacy difficulties so particularly helps with you know spelling and grammar and things like that so they can actually focus on the ideas that they're trying to express um you know rather than worrying about the actual spelling and things like that um the snap type app that um helps children fill in this you know like school worksheets if they get school worksheets and you know they're having to write you know fill in the blanks and things like that with the pen. So instead of using the pen, you would actually use the iPad and you would take a photo of the worksheet and then the app actually allows you to edit that worksheet um, either by typing it um, or using speech to text as well. So that, that one can be really good. Um, label markers. Um, so I haven't actually used this one before either, um, but I, I think I believe it takes a little, little bit of time. So it'd be quite time consuming. But again, it can be quite good for short answers um, or like fill in the blanks assignments and things like that. Um, but obviously, yeah, you've got printing and things like that. So, yeah, it might just take a little bit of time. 
Um, then you've got the recordable talking boxes. Um, so this allows um, children to record a 10 second message and then it's played when the box is opened. So I guess this is probably going to be more appropriate for children, you know, who have very limited kind of fine motor skills or obviously unable to type. Maybe, um, you know, obviously they're again going to have difficulty with writing, but obviously maybe we're, we're trying to develop their early language skills. And um, so this can be quite a good um, motivating um, uh, activity for them. Having someone scribe as well. So, yeah, having someone write down their answers for them as well. Um, and yeah, I'm pretty sure I've gone through them all there. Yeah. OK. Um, so looking, thinking about using iPad apps. Um, so obviously, if your child is having difficulty forming their letters or numbers correctly, you know, or they haven't actually mastered those pre-writing shapes, there's various iPad apps that you can you can try that are some that are extremely useful and exciting and very interactive for children. Um, you know, they can also help to develop um, the underlying skills that you need for pre-writing and letter formation. So things like their hand coordination, their memory, their visual perceptual skills and things like that. And um, so, yeah, there's quite a few little names there that are just popping up. So you've got the wet, dry, try app, um, drawing apps, sparkle paint, writing wizard. Um, so, yeah, you've got this for reference here if you want to check some of them out. Some of them are paid, some of them are free. Um, and some letter formation apps as well, like I write words light, letter school, um, what do I try again? Um, so yeah, it depends on the child and, and what they're interested in. You might have to try a few, um, but yeah, these can be a very useful tool, like I said, for children who are struggling um, with using the pencil or you just can't get their attention or motivation quite, quite just yet. Um, and these are some of the resources and suppliers um, that we go to. Um, so, you know, for example, we talked about things earlier like um, pencil grips and um, writing slopes um, wobble cushions, slant boards, hair putty. Um, yeah, all of these kind of resources can be purchased um, on, on some of these um, suppliers here, even the, um, the handwriting programs and things like that. Um, so yeah, these are just tend to be the ones that that we go to and we recommend. So they're they're here and um, for your reference. Amazon is always a good one. It always tends to have everything. Um, and yeah, I think believe we're at the end now. So yeah, thank you so much for listening. Um, I really hope you found it useful, and um, and you could take some strategies and really try them um in school, um or at home. Um, and obviously this is a recorded session, so you don't obviously have the opportunity to ask any questions. But if you do, um, please feel free to get in touch with your school Senko, who can then contact the allocated OT for the school. Um, and we can try and advise you on any particular aspect of handwriting that you're you're struggling with or that you're just not too sure about. Um, or for kind of any more general OT queries, you can always contact our lovely and um, lead Ellie Lolly, um, who is joining us in the presentation today, and that's her email there as well. Um, or you can access our our send local offer as well, where we have more um, OT resources um, and advice coming in the next few weeks as well. Okay, thank you so much for listening.